open the eyes of my heart I want to see you See, I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you Sing, I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power Fathers, we come before you this evening. We honor your presence. We give you glory for who you are. We thank you right now for this time of study, this time of worship, this time to come in and just learn more about you, Father. We ask right now that you would just open our hearts to hear from heaven, open our ears to hear, open our hearts to receive what thus saith the Lord. We ask that the word once again will go out from you through this vessel into a, 
this congregation and then into a lost and dying generation until so that it would continue to amplify, edify, and glorify your name. For we know that when your word goes forward, it will not return to you void, but it will prosper into the place where you send it. Father, be with our pastor right now, our bishop right now, and first lady as they are traveling, even on this tough day, this hard day, where they are coming up on the anniversary. We've just come up on the anniversary of Shondell's passing. And at the same time, give comfort, even right now, for we know that this is a challenging day, but also a day that's required of, of respite and, and just to have rest uh, from the labors. And we know that he's been laboring very hard in this in this vineyard, Father. So we ask right now that you would just continue to be with him and give them safety and safe passage and safe travel. And now, Father, just open your word up to us this evening that we might hear from you so we might take action with it, to have a call to action that we can go forth and tell somebody else about the good news of Jesus our Christ. Amen. All right. Are we pushing, Will? I'm, look, I'm looking on the chat, and I don't see anybody on the chat right now. But is anybody out there? We're good? Okay. All right. Let's don't see anybody. All right. They all, the pastor went away. <laughs> they ain't on tonight, I guess. And they may be on. I just, maybe I have to turn a different way to kind of see them. Nope. Turned it that way, and they're still not there. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the building on the foundation of Christ. Uh, the pastor has been in there talking a lot about, you know, the Trinity. So I'm going to build a little bit, not on that, but maybe touch on it that just a little bit. However, we just focus on the building of the foundation of Christ. And our scripture for this evening is going to be 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. And after I read the scripture, I'll tell you a little bit of why I, I wanted to felt led to to uh, chat about this tonight as I was having some conversation with pastor a couple uh, about last week. First Corinthians 3, 9 through 15. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed on how he builds on it. For no other foundation, no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work. Of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, it will receive a reward. If, it's, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So it always interests me and pains me that sometimes Christians get salvation and works messed up. And so we think a lot of times that there is a work to be done to earn our way into salvation. And I, we hear it all the time. We hear it a lot of times, even when we come into the sanctuary, and we see somebody that may not be dressed the way we think they should be dressed. Oh, they going to hell because they ain't dressed this way. And so what does, when we look at this tonight, um, what does it say and what we just heard about the foundation? Who's the foundation? Did it again, Ash? Jesus, yeah, Jesus is the foundation. So I got a question then, when it looks at this of laying the foundation, then why does Paul say that he's the foundation? Doesn't it, doesn't it say that? We, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. Or does it say that he's the foundation? I have laid the foundation. I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. Is he saying that, or what is he saying? What do you think he's saying? He's speaking of Christ, yeah. So because he's doing that, a lot of times what happens is we get off in a different direction, and we don't go back to the foundation. Whatever we must do in, 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 our, in our lives, it's a lot of us have to just go back when things kind of get out of sorts, we go back to the foundation of where we have started. And that gets us moving in the, the right direction. 
Uh, when my mother passed on December 9th, I had, a really, I had a lot of trouble getting back started again in my work environment as, a, as an entrepreneur. Didn't know kind of where to start, I was kind of lost. But I went back to the values of what I said I was going to do, which was given to me by God, and which I believe was to, to have, to offer value into other individuals. So, so when I went back to that foundation, I was able to begin to build again. And so we see that if we just go back to that foundation, we can begin to erect and build. So tonight we're going to look at scripture to understand the difference between salvation and works. We say that we can't work our way to salvation, but then we turn around and condemn people for the action that they're doing that don't align with how we believe a person should live if they are a professed Christian. So let's look at five points tonight. One, we'll talk about laying the foundation. The second, we'll talk about salvation, not of works. The third is foundational beginnings. And the fourth is rewards. And then fifth, if we get to it, knowing them by their fruits. Knowing them by their fruits. So we talked and we found and established that in this scripture, Christ is the foundation. And then we squared away Paul's statement in verse 10, which he seems to say that he's the foundation, but he's really pointing to Christ. And Bishop has been t teaching us in Bible study that there is a, this Trinity thing that's going on, right? And he's been talking about it that there are, you know, three parts of the Godhead, which are who? Yeah, Father, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit, right? So we got God the Father, and the God the Father is where right now? Right now, where's God the Father? Where will we say he is? Up? <laughs> He's up. <laughs> where's God the Father? What do we call it? In heaven, right. So he's, he's in heaven. So we have, like, we got the heaven that's right here. We have the heaven that we can see right above us. He's in the third heaven, the one that we can't see behind the veil of all those stars that are up there, right? So now we have God the Son. Where's God the Son right now? Right, in heaven. Is, is he here? Okay. <laughs> Which heaven now? Which heaven? <laughs> okay, there we go. So he's not here. A lot of times we're thinking that, you know, well, Jesus is by my side. He's right here. Jesus, be my co-pilot. He's there. He's there, right? He's in, he's in the third heaven. So God, the Holy Spirit, is where? He's here on earth and residing where? In us, right? Indwells us. We, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, Okay. So we got that, and we, we've been, that's good, Pastor. I'm going to be happy that you all have said that, <laughs> that back. So what is the job, then, of the Holy Spirit? What's the job? What's, what's, what's the job of the Holy Spirit? Keep us on the right track? Okay, I, I can go with that. What else do you think? Bring, bring peace to you. Okay. Help me, Holy Spirit, because I'm about to get froggy. <laughs> Keep me, temper me, hold me, hold me. Holy Spirit. Yep. And, and then what were you saying? The Holy Spirit. To guide us, yeah, to guide us. So leads us into all truth, into all mystery. So I was, you know, kind of just talking and looking and kind of researching. Holy Spirit is co-equal with God, the Father and God the Son, and is of the same essence. Yet he is also distinct from them. Scripture describes the Holy Spirit in personal terms, not as an impersonal force. When it says that he teaches, guides, comforts, and intercedes, he possesses emotion, intellect, and will. The Holy Spirit spoke to Philip and gave counsel to the church in Jerusalem. He was, he was sinned against and lied to. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Boom, down you go. <laughs> you dropped. Drop it like it's hot. <laughs> the, script, the scriptures also attest to the deity of the Holy Spirit. He is spoken of of God and is identified with the title Jehovah. The Christian who is indwelt in the, in the Spirit is indwelt by God. The Holy Spirit possesses the attributes of deity, such as omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, and eternal, inter, internal, internal, internality, internality, so always eternal, right? Uh, he, does, he does work only God can do, such as creating, regenerating, and sanctifying. 
he is equally associated with the other members of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit today plays a major role in the applications of salvation to the individual. It is the Spirit who brings conviction to the believer. So if the Holy Spirit is bringing conviction to the believer, can I bring conviction to the believer? Why? Because the Holy Spirit's within inside of us. But do I do it inside of my flesh or do I do it with the Spirit? We do it with the Spirit. But yet some people try to do it with the flesh. And they get out of the Spirit. They, they grieve the Holy Spirit, push the Holy Spirit to the side and say, you need to act like this if you want to get to that. And there's a, right, and there's a quid pro quo to it, right, that we try to say you have to have salvation in, in such a way and that way is not the way that Christ has said it must come. So we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit that's leading us. It pulls us into it. So there is, that's why Paul says, Paul plants and polishes waters, but God gives the increase. So we don't know where we might be on that path in somebody's journey. Somebody could be, you know, I've, I've shared here and I'll share again. One of my prayers was, I, I want to see my fruit, Lord. I want to see my fruit. And so God sent me out of what I was doing over to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I said, what's going on? <laughs> um, but I began to understand that as I was kind of trembling when I was about to, when I learned I had to go to go fight and go to war, because I said, I, I don't know if I'm coming back. And that, that freaked me out. And I started, you know, boo-hooing. But I got on the plane and God started speaking. He said, you know, you said you want to see your fruit. I'm going to show you the whole plan. So on the plane, I started praying and fasting and just kind of see what the, the Lord's direction was. I get off the plane. I'm in uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and we're about to, <laughs> you've had an experience. I see, Angie, 10 years there. <laughs> uh, I get off the plane. I'm in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. There, I'm getting ready to, to do a load for the flight. There's a gentleman who's next to me. He's a um, Hispanic gentleman, and we start talking and sharing, and I begin witnessing to him and tell him about my personal journey, testifying of my personal journey. Uh, and then he gets up and he walks, walks away, and that was the last I saw him. Until about a month and a half later when we were in the middle of the desert and we had built up a little white church that was there. I had been away for almost about a month back in Dahran. I came back. We had started this little church. Um, and that Hispanic gentleman came, got up and gave his life to Christ. And when my friend, who was doing the church with me, said, you know, how did how'd you come to accept Christ? And he looked back and said it was because of him. And I'm, I'm like, what, what do you mean, me? I don't even remember this guy. And he said he witnessed to me on the, on the bus. And then we started loading the plane, and somebody else began witnessing to me there. Then we got on the plane, and he said, I sat next to a gentleman who, who kept witnessing to me all the way till we got to Saudi Arabia. Then we got out of the plane, went to this little church that started building up here, and I started coming every night to hear this, this gospel. And then tonight, this is the first night I came back from Dahran, he says, I'm giving my life to Christ. And, and, that was, and God showed me that whole way. So we never know where we are on that journey when the Holy Spirit is speaking to us to be part of somebody else's life because we want everyone to be saved. Why? Because if we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that's what Christ says. I don't want anyone to lose this salvation, this gift I'm giving to you. So if we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, we shouldn't want anyone to lose that gift, even if they make us angry, if they are rubbing us the wrong way. We still are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit still wants to draw that individual because the, the eternity without Christ is an eternity without God. Think about that. Eternity. How long do most of us get on this earth? Maybe 70, maybe 80, if you're lucky, 90 years, right, on this earth. How long has it been since Christ has come? For 2,000 years. How long do they say that the earth has been in existence? Some say millions of years. And that still is not eternity. Do we want somebody to be eternally lost? No, the Holy Spirit wants to draw them. Because that was not prepared for 
humans in the first place. It was prepared for the, those the devils the, that had, had tried to usurp the throne and got cast out. That's what it was made for. And now, because of the sin of Adam, now we are cast into that, and we are guilty as charged. And so we have to have the buffer, right? So as we begin this in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer permanently. And while the child of God may sin, grieve the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will never leave the true nature of the, the will never leave the true believer. Absence of the Holy Spirit is the mark of the unsaved. Absence is the mark of, of the Holy Spirit, is the, is the mark of the unsaved. The only difference between a non believer and a believer is the Holy Spirit. That's the only difference. One is saved, the other one is not. And so because of that, we can't really elevate our stature or elevate ourselves and say, oh, my gosh, I got the Holy Spirit. I'm better than you. <laughs> All we're saying is that I am covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I want to extend that blood to you through the Holy Spirit and that gifting of that. So the Holy Spirit indwells the believer permanently, we said, the Holy Spirit seals the believer. The ministry guarantees the security of the believer until the day of redemption. I'll kind of stop it there. Paul, Apollos, and all of, all of the believers are indwelled with the Holy Spirit who leads us into the true foundation. That's why he can say, I have the foundation to lay before you. And the foundation we have established is Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.5. 1 Corinthians 3.5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? Who then is Jackie? Who then is Angela? Except ministers through whom you believed because they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Christ the foundation. No other foundation can be laid that was already laid. So if this is the case, why then do we try to make people do some type of activity in order to obtain Christ? If you don't cry or have an emotional experience when you're out here on the altar, you can't be saved. If you don't yell or spit and shout, nope, you don't, you don't got the foundation. You got to have an experience. <laughs> oh, you too quiet. You got to make some noise to have a, 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 a spirit-filled experience. You should be shouting. You're too noisy to have God as your foundation. You should be quiet. We're always trying to make somebody do something in order to earn our praise and our, what we think they should have to make us believe that they're saved and have the foundation. Who are we for that when we needed that? My experience was in the third deck at a university in Indiana at a youth triennium for Presbyterian kids. 13 to 17, and um, Andrew Young gave the message that day. And I don't know what it was about it, but my father's a Presbyterian minister. Andrew Young gave this message, gave the invita invitation, and right there in my seat, I accepted Christ. I was 13 years old. Now, I didn't lose my mind for Christ until I was like 21, 22, but I, I gave it. <laughs> and I was kept by the Holy Spirit through that time, you know, because I had the foundation. We're going to talk about how I was building on that foundation a little bit later. But why do we always try to make somebody fit our parameters of what we think salvation is? The most um, interesting and most um, segregated hours, as has been said, in, in, in America is the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock hour on Sunday morning. Because you don't worship like I worship, so therefore you can't be and we begin to judge each person's salvation. Them holy rollers over there. Oh, they're Baptists. Oh, they're Methodists. Mm. Oh, they, they church got a Christ. Coach it. Oh. And we begin to separate instead of seeing how people are building upon the foundation of Christ. So anytime we begin to move off in that direction, it should trigger us to know we are getting off of that platform. We're, all, we're into ourself instead of into what God has intended for each one of us, and that is to breathe life into someone else, right? The, ins, the inspiration word of God, which comes from the Latin word inspiro or inspiro. 
In spirit was I breathe life into you. The life is because of the spirit that's in me, so I can breathe it into you. Life generates, it elevates. There's only two things that are happening in our lives. We're either living or we're dying. What did it say? What's that movie? You either get rid Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> Get busy living or get busy dying. We're only doing one or two things. If something's not growing, it's dying. As soon as, a, as soon as you stop watering a plant, it begins to die. It doesn't exist in a sustainable state. It begins to die. So we have to nurture and, and continue with those relationships and begin to breathe life into them. And they can elevate. So when, the, when this happens, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, and it comes... It, 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 when somebody becomes saved, it doesn't matter if they have an emotional experience or not. Because this, even though God has given us emotions, it's not tied, we're, our, our salvation is not tied to an emotion. It's tied to the work of Christ on the cross. It's his work, not our work, not our tears or our laughter or the emotion that we might experience as we come and give our life to Christ. Yeah, we might have an emotional experience, but it's based upon Christ's work. Not my emotions. If it was based on my emotions, we'd be all over the place. Because <laughs> I'm up one day, down the next day. It's based upon Christ's work on the cross. Salvation is not of works. So let's go to Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. I'm tired of reading. Let me get the mic up. Who's got it? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> you got? Okay, I'm going to come back. And you can run that mic back there. Right back there. Yeah, Reverend Joyce. Reverend Joyce is going to read Ephesians 2, 4 through 10. Ephesians 4. Ephesians sorry. 2, 4 oh, through sorry. 10. Ephesians 2. <laughs> Thank you. Chapter 2. Because if, if you read chapter 4, no. I'm going to question your <laughs> foundation. <laughs> Whatever. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 4. Mm -hmm. Okay. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. Thy grace, by grace ye are saved, and have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he may show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not and, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should walk in them. Amen. What are we created for? What are we created for? Verse 10, what does it say? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for what? Good works. So again, we're talking about the foundation. We've been laid on this foundation, right? Because he's just established in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through your faith. What is faith? Faith is a substance, right, of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. So if faith is a substance, it's something that I can actually touch. I can feel it. It's in my hands. I can grasp it. That's faith. We think that faith is an abstract. It's out there someplace else. Faith is a substance of things that I'm hoping for. So, for example, I got this bottle of water, and I say, you know, hey, hey, um, Brother Will, could you bring a bottle of water? 
I have faith that it's on, on the way. It's, it's tangible. It's, it's, it's in existence right now. All it has to do is show up in my reality when he walks down the steps and brings me and says, hey, Brother John, here's a bottle of water. It's already on the way when we have faith. Faith is the things of the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What's evidence? What's evidence? We're in court, right? Bring out the evidence. The evidence is what exonerates or convicts, right? Lack of or having it. So we want, it's, it's evidence. That's what, what faith is. So when we see that for grace have you been saved through your faith and that not of yourselves, that takes it off of us and puts it where? In verse 8. What does is, what is, what, what, what do we say? What does it say? What's the gift? It's the gift of God. When we give a gift to somebody, it is up to them whether they're going to accept or reject the gift. Sometimes we give a gift, we think we're giving a gift, but we want something back in exchange for the gift. So I give you on Christmas Day, give you those diamonds, and I'm expecting something back. I want, I want, the, I want the car back in return later on. I want, yeah, I want, I want a quid pro quo. And that's how we look at things. We want, in our own natural selves, when we give a gift or, we, or somebody says, hey, hey uh, can, I, can I borrow $5? We ask them, when are you going to return it? <laughs> With interest. <laughs> when somebody is asked, if I, have, if I have it, and don't you all do this, <laughs> if I have it, I just give it. I don't expect it back. It's, it's gone from my life as, as far as that's concerned, right? That I'm not even, I'm even thinking it's coming back to me. That way I don't have holding something over somebody. Remember uh, Sister Joyce, um, uh, that $5 I gave you? You, you know, uh, you only want to, she said five, that's it. <laughs> remember that, remember that $5.50 I gave you? <laughs> Last year? Remember when I borrowed your lawnmower? You borrowed my lawnmower? I want that thing back. So, you know, these things, we, we begin to look at a quid pro quo. Holy Spirit's saying, it's a, it's, a, it's a gift. It's a true gift. I don't, I don't want anything back in return. I'm not trying to, to use the gift for something else. I'm not going to take it down to um, Goodwill and return it. I'm not going to take it back. Where's the receipt for it? So I can get something better. It's a gift. And so how do we treat? gifts that people give to us. Do we honor the gift and keep it with it and cherish it? Or do we just say, oh man, I, I wish I could have had something else. I, 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 I just really need something else. So that's what we say. For, for, for by grace have you been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Not of works. Why is it not of works? Why does, it, why does he want to make, why does Paul want to make this in Ephesians want to make this to emphatically state it's not of works. Why does he say that? What will we do if we, if we can say it was, it was works? We can boast about it. We can boast about it. Remember, we have, we have many examples in the Bible talking about, eh, <laughs> this is on God, not on me, because I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything to, earn, to think that I've done anything in this situation. We, the, the most that we can do to push away the, ex the exaltation of somebody trying to elevate us instead of elevating God is what we should be after. And I'm in a situation all the time where, where praise comes in after, after a speaking engagement, and, I, and the, all the lines out there, oh, I just love your story and everything. I said, glory be to God. Glory be to God. And, and that, it was tough to say that when I first thought, because I would say, oh, glory be to God. And I would, <laughs> I would just blow right over it. But now it, it comes out, it's, it's a natural thing, right? It's, it's because that's who the glory goes to. It's not that he gave me the story, but, but it's, it's, it's on, it's, everything is on him. I don't, I don't need to take credit. So when I say in the, in the, in the prayer, you know, Lord, um, you know, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Every time I go out to, to chop and, and chat. And then it always opens up usually about 90% of the time, always opens up where somebody asks, 
Tell me more about, I mean, there's got to be more than that, your story. What, what's, I mean, what's the real essence of, of, of who you are? Now I get a chance to share the gospel. And it's not about me. I get a chance to just blow it out of proportion, right? And, and I love it when it's in front of the entire group and somebody's asking the question and I got 2,000 people in front of me. Now I get a chance to just open up and just, just share the gospel of Christ. And that is the most, that's, that, I love those moments that, that just come like that. Yeah, just planting seeds. That's exactly right. I don't, I'm not responsible for the growth of it. I'm responsible for planting. Not responsible for the growth. That's Holy Spirit's job, right? Paul plants Apollos waters. God gives the increase. I ain't got to worry about it once I plant the seed. I can go off to the next and plant another, another seed. And that's, that's where we should try to be and try to put ourselves in that situation because the consequences are, are just too great for not doing it. Eternity separated, right? That's, that's just too much when you think of it. It's mind-blowing. Just, it, just, it just freaks my mind out when I think about it. So I thought about some examples of how this foundation and works thing works. Uh, in the natural, in our setting here. So I was a track and field athlete. So I looked at the track as being the foundation, the meat that I go to. That's the foundation. Uh, I must run the race to receive a reward. If I don't run the race, race I don't get the reward, right? If, if, uh, how hard I, r I run the race can depend upon what my position is in the race. And so that's what he's saying. As, as we begin to build on this foundation, the foundation comes first, and then the works comes afterward. So we see, uh, maybe in jobs, maybe the business that we go to, the establishment is the foundation. I must show up to work to receive the reward, my paycheck. If I, don't, if I got the job and I don't show up, I don't get the paycheck. And maybe I don't get the job anymore. <laughs> Maybe the foundation's gone. <laughs> no, we're not. Wrong example. Uh, <laughs> we don't lose the foundation. Um, and then, and, and like I said, in professional speaking, so many coaches are out there telling clients how to get speaking engagements. I don't, I don't do that. Uh, they, tell you the, they tell people to market on social media. They tell people to, to speak to their chamber of commerce or go speak for free to get the reps in. Uh, that's all great advice. But if you don't have a story to market, it doesn't matter what you put on social media or what you market. You have to have a product. The product that we have and dwelt in us as a foundation, that foundation through the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. We want to present Christ. It doesn't crumble. It, 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 it always is there. He's always there. Um, music. What's the, what's the foundation of music? Oh, he's gone. Where'd he go? So maybe learning keys, strings, et cetera, learning scales, learning the circle of fifths. Maybe these are foundational to learn how to, to play. So the beginning of the foundation for the believer in John 3, Nicodemus uh, this whole excerpt, we, we, we've, we've, we've talked about this, but for those that might be listening in, I only see Calandra on right now. <laughs> Calandra, you're supposed to be right there. <laughs> I'm calling her out on social. Um, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to, Nick, to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a great teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So first he can't see the kingdom of God, now he can't even enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus said, are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how you will believe if I tell you earthly, uh, heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we see that, once again, he's saying that there is a foundation that needs to be laid to Nicodemus' life. He has to be born again. He's beginning to set up his, his march to the cross 
of what he's going to do for us and pay the sin uh, price, the sin penalty for all mankind, right? All, when I say mankind, I'm, I'm meaning humanity. If we, if you take the, the, the Greek word of that. So that is what he is beginning to say to Nicodemus. And he says, you have to be born of water and the spirit because you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you, unless you do that. And that's a commitment that must be made by each individual. No one can do it for us. But a lot of times people want other individuals to make that commitment for them. We're seeing it right now in our whole, in our, in, in America, right? We want people to make commitments for us because we don't want to be hold, held responsible for anything. When I, when I talk to, you know, audiences, I, I say that here's, here's my call to action sometimes. I'll say, you've been at this conference for the last three days. I know that you've learned one thing that was of value to you. So whatever that thing is, I want you to write it down. And I want you to, you don't have to do the whole thing tomorrow, but at some point, I want you to make a commitment to one thing, just one thing that you can do to get towards that goal that you have written down. And then I'll say, who's going to hold you accountable to it? And everybody says, I will. I'll hold myself accountable. I said, no, you won't. You're going to find a partner at your table, and you're going to get their telephone number, and you're going to call them at 10 o'clock tomorrow and tell them how far you got along on that one thing that you were supposed to do. And you should see them jump out those seats because no one wants to be held to the commitment of being held accountable to what they said they're going to do. We don't want anyone to hold us accountable for that. We want to just say we're going to do it on, on our own. And how, how many of us have said, I'm going to do this one thing, maybe it's, um, in my case, try to lose some weight, and I get started. It's great for day one. <laughs> day two comes, I say, oh, I get a little uh, Oreo, Oreo cookie. <laughs> Day three comes, say I get two Oreo cookies. <laughs> Do my workout on day on, on day, day day four, and and the rest of the cookies are gone. <laughs> I'm not gonna hold myself accountable. <laughs> I need an accountability partner. Holy Spirit leads us in all truth and all mystery. We need that partnership with the Holy Spirit to, to do that. And so as we move into this section now. You know, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. We're talking about this foundation. There, th therefore, this, that's Matthew 7, 24. Isaiah 28 and 6 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. Okay, so now we've, we've established the foundation. Let's go into the rewards even more so now with the remaining time we have. So verse 11, going back in Corinthians, says, For no other foundation can be laid which is already laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, it will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned... He will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So let's go back up and take a look at that uh, in verse number 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, what happens to those three when they're tested by fire? You get gold, silver, and precious stones. You put them on the altar. You, you, start, you burn them up. What happens to them? What's that? I can't they incinerate? No, they don't incinerate. They melt. Yeah, and what? And the gold will melt. I didn't hear it. Decompose. No, they get they get they get more refined. When we want, what, what does gold look like when it comes out of the ground? It's black. It's black. And so they understand what it is. So what they do is they put it in the fire and they begin to refine it. We're not, we're not to the straw yet. <laughs> we're on, the, go, we're on the, 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 the gold, silver, and precious stones. Each one of those materials, when we put them in the fire, they, beget, they get more refined. It becomes more gold the more you refine it over and over again. That's what the sparkles are that we see in the gold. But when it comes out of the earth, it's black. That's the value of it, but then we, it gets more value because we want it shiny. We don't want to put a lump of rock that's a, 
that's black on our, our, our finger that just came out of the earth, it's all got dirt on and stuff, we refine it. Remember we talked about the refining, the refiner's fire, you know? Um, so it's, it's refined. It's all those gold, silver, and precious stones. Now we get to the wood, hay, and straw, Sister Karen. What happens to them when they're, when they're, with fire hits them? With like the three little pigs. <laughs> <laughs> house is gone. So we see with gold, silver, and precious stones, anyone's work which he has built and endures will receive a reward. So we have a foundation. The race has been run. That person built with gold, silver, and precious stones, they receive a reward. That person that built upon the foundation, that built with wood, hay, and stubble, straw, the work is tested, they receive the foundation. They don't get the reward. It's burn up. So when individuals come into the sanctuary, for example, and they have the foundation, yet they are not building upon that foundation, you still have that baseline, that platform. You've just lost your reward. So what's the reward? How do we get those rewards? What does the Bible say? Christ said, anyone that uh, believes in me and does my work, so what's the work? When we come into the house of worship, do we act? Do we do, we do ministry? Do we continue to, 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 um, to push Christ out in, in our communities, in our spheres of influence? Or do we hold him back and grieve the spirit? Because I'm too afraid to talk to that individual over there. I'd rather have them spend eternity without Christ. That's what we're saying. If we don't go and talk to that individual, that the Holy Spirit is pulling us, tugging us, because we don't know where we are in that person's life cycle of going to be with Christ or not. Like that guy that was in that, witness to on the plane, we don't know where we are. And we, Christ tells us to go speak to that individual, we don't do it. Maybe he brings somebody else along to, to do it. But we've just lost a piece of our reward because we were too chicken to go and talk to them. What happens when the, uh, the, anybody else that comes, there's no other foundation that can be laid that is laid, and, and a Jehovah Witness shows up at your, your front door? We lost an opportunity. Mormon comes to the door, riding them bicycles. We jump, peeking out the, peeking out the window. In, in, uh, in, Sp in Springfield, Virginia, where I was living, my, my wife and I were living, um, <laughs> I would invite him in. <laughs> Have to, we'd sit them down, we'd talk, right? Then I brought a pastor over. You know, they came over a few times. They kept coming. They brought their pastor. I brought my pastor. Right? <laughs> and we, we, we would talk. And I got savvy, so savvy with how they were doing it that I began just to ask them the basic question, right? When you start getting off in the weeds and stuff, you, it's, it's too much. The basic question that you can ask somebody to really understand if they got the spirit or not is to say, who's Jesus Christ? Who's Jesus Christ? Is he a prophet? Or just one of the best teachers? Or is he the son of God incarnate that came down here to die for my sin? Came through the Holy Spirit and, and, and Mary. Is he who he says he is? And that's the baseline. Because you can't get past that. There's no need to have another conversation. There's no need for argument. There's no need to get chippy or froggy. If we can't get past that, we can't build on anything. There's nothing to build on. You don't even have the foundation. I need you to hear from me, the Holy Spirit that's in me, to speak to you so that you can understand, not from me, but from the Holy Spirit, where you're erring. So what happened in Virginia? They put our house on the do not come by list. Because <laughs> them kids were coming in and getting converted. That's what was happening. And we can do that. And it's not on us. Not, it wasn't me. I don't brag on that. It was on the Holy Spirit. That's in me. Because I want them to understand who Christ is. When, I, when, when you visit up there in, the, in, the, in that area, you'll see the whole history and, and of Christ depicted is beautiful. 
And then you walk around the corner and you see the angels coming back to Joseph Smith to give another gospel. And like, what is this? <laughs> no other foundation can be laid that's been already laid. And be careful how you build on that foundation. Wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stones. All right, we got it. Two minutes, okay. All right, so <clears throat> tried by fire. Wood, hay, stubble, burned up. We got Karen, Sister Karen said that. So um, do all, you do all this work after professing Christ, and it does not amount to anything. It's burning up. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 3, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, if I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but if I have not love, it profits me nothing. What's in here? Not my heart, this heart, this ticking thing. Because we know that in Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says, I, the Lord, tries the reins. Gold, silver, and precious stones are refined. Um, I think it's Zechariah 13 and 9. It says, I will bring the one-third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. Then will I call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. That's Zechariah 13, 9. A heavenly inheritance. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more than precious than gold, than that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise honor and glory in, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we see that it's a refining process, the refining's fire. Uh, I think we had, um, what's that, the, the Handel's Messiah, one of the, 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 the songs in there is the, re, the refining's fire. Um, and that's, that's kind of where that comes from right there. Um, let's see here. Those of us who are in Christ and who have built on this foundation will be found blameless in his day. The fire will reveal it, 1 Corinthians 1 and 8, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We will have our works judged, not works to earn salvation, because that is a gift. Our works are going to be judged on how we have built on that foundation. And, they, and, the, and the metaphor for this is fire. They will be burned to see what lasts and what goes away. Because there are positions in heaven, the different positions, and we're working right now to figure out what position we're going to get. Some people are doorkeepers, gatekeepers. Some people are going to be, uh, you know, over kingdoms and, and things that are, 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 are um, you know how they talk about it with, um, um, like how the military, kind of the best example, like Pastor says, like the military. Like you're over a charge of a certain section, right? be that. You might be one of the workers in, the, in that. So there's all these things that are going on up in heaven, and we're, we're just thinking that, you know, I just, I just want to squeak through. <laughs> no, I want a job. <laughs> Give me a good job. I want, I want a good job with, with good benefits. Good benefits. Good job. Good benefits. Um, Malachi 3.17. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Again, Malachi states that we are jewels. Jewels are refined in the fire. Romans 2, 5 and 16, but in accordance with your hardness and your imp imp impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So look at this. Roman teaches us that there is a treasure of wrath. What is wrath? Wrath is fury. Wrath is anger. Wrath is rage. And that's a treasure that people are laying up for themselves right now. They are actually earning these things in heaven. A wrath that comes. But this is according to the hardness of your uh, impenitent heart. So that's, that's the impenitent heart is not the one that is, 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 is the saved one, right? These individuals are, are earning the wrath of God because there is no barrier and buffer in a foundation that is Christ. There's no Holy Spirit indwelling in them. 
That's why they're incurring the wrath. That was laid up for, for who? It wasn't for human, humans. Who was it for? We said it earlier. Satan. And who else? And, and the imps, right? The, and the, Satan and the imps. <laughs> Romans teaches us that there is a treasure of wrath, fury, rage. As well as Revelation says, surprise, you know, uh, disclosure of God's righteous judgment. They're going to be surprised by that. Even though they've been told down here through the Holy Spirit that this is what's waiting for you, they're still saying, ah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need that. I don't need that from church folk. And Satan's blinded the eyes because that's what he wants. That's what he desires. He, he has come. That's, that's his mission. He wants to do that. So we have to break it down through the Holy Spirit. That's why we've got to talk to folks that we don't feel comfortable talking to. We want to do this to them. Maybe turn around, do something else, show them our non-ring finger. But, you know, that's, what we want. That's, what, that's, our, that's our flesh talking and speaking. We have to come through with the Holy Spirit. Um. So, <laughs> this is one I like. People, say, you know, I get a lot of people say, well, how come, how come God could just, you know, destroy good people? <laughs> I'm like, have, have you, you think we're good? <laughs> hmm. I, I fight all the time. Look at babies in the crib. <laughs> you get two babies in the crib. One's fighting the other one over attention. They don't, they don't know nothing, but they, they know who's who going to get that bottle first, <laughs> and they're going to scream it. They fight over the teething ring. Look at toddlers. Mommy took my spoon. Who taught them that? Who taught them that at such a young age? We are born with this nature in us. Toddlers steal. They will hide your keys. They will hide your wallet. When you got to go someplace, you're looking all over the place for it. And they laugh when they pull them out from underneath this. <laughs> Who taught them that? Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints uh, and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So last piece we're going to talk about right here is there is a way to know the false prophet. When we have the foundation, we're building upon the foundation, there are going to be those that come that are going to fool the very elect. And so how do we recognize, how do we know that? So Christ has given us something in Matthew 7, 15 through 16 that says, beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing. How does, how does sheep act, right? They, they follow the crowd. They won't even, they, you know, they won't even eat unless it's really safe, they, you know, they, to, to, to do so. They are the, the most kind of feeblish of, of the animals. So it's interesting that Christ, you know, God calls a sheep. <laughs> um, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. So it's like the wolf and sheep clothing. We, we, we hear that metaphor a lot. Uh, you will know them by their fruits. That's why I wanted, I wanted the prayer early on. I want to know my fruit, Lord. I want to see my fruit. And God said, don't worry about it. You got, I got you. Don't worry about it. But I kept asking. And that's when he sent me to Saudi Arabia. Right? So we got to be careful about what we ask. But however, remember, when God said, let there be light, when he says, let there be, it goes forward. That's why I always pray when, when, you're, when, you're, uh, when the word goes forward, it does not return void. It's not going to return the same way it went out. It's not even going to return. It, it keeps moving. We, the, 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 the astronomers keep finding more stars. Why? Because the universe keeps expanding. 
because he said, let there be. And it continues to this day. Over the millions of years, it it's, it's continues to expand. So when we say a prayer, and we're earnest in that prayer, that prayer never stops. It continues to move forward. It continues. So when I prayed, I want to know my fruit, guess what God continues to do in my life? Shows me my fruit. Every once in a while, I'm like, oh, my gosh, it just keeps, it just keeps on going. It never stops. We just have to begin to listen how God is speaking to us. There was, I was talking to a pastor last week, we were having lunch, and I said, um, here's this book, I, I read it over and over again, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a faith book, it's a Christian book, and, but I don't read it for that. I read it because the first story this guy talks about is a story of an entomologist, somebody that studies bugs. An entomologist was studying crickets, and that entomologist could hear, Guinness Book of World Records, hears over 300 types of cricket sounds. I didn't even know there were 300 crickets in the world, let alone you can identify 300 sounds of crickets. So I started testing when I was in Saudi Arabia. I started, you know, helicopters would fly around. I would close my eyes and see if I could identify the helicopter. And I got pretty good. I could get about five helicopters identified. But the book goes on to say is what are we tuning into? If I can identify five different helicopters, this guy can identify 300 crickets, how come I can't hear the voice of God? I can listen to everything. I know every word to a song or a rap or something on the radio, but I can't hear the voice of God? What's my frequency that I'm tuning into? Because God's continuing to speak. I'm just not dialed into the frequency. So i got to tune myself to hear what thus saith the Lord. How's the Holy Spirit going to use me today to impact somebody's life? Because that's the direction that the Spirit wants me to move. But I'm too busy listening to other stuff. And I can't hear clearly. And I don't put myself in a, in a state of prayer and fasting so I can open up the channels and dial into it. And that's, that's for all of us. That's for me as well, right? That's, i got to constantly do that. That's the battle. Because I hear something that goes on over there and all of a sudden my attention goes that way i got to get focused back in on it. That's why that prayer call is so important in the morning time, to set our day. 5.30 in the morning, get on it, 15 minutes. Just at least do that to set the day, right? So we want to be able to hear and attune our ear to, to Christ. All right, so uh, was that all right tonight? I was, that's, um, we're done with, with that, so amen on, on the lesson. Um, so I hope there's a more clear and different between salvation and the works that we have to do, to, we can't earn the salvation. So hopefully that, that was clear, more clear. Uh, so for this evening, uh, for those that might be out there listening on social or in here, I, don't, I never want to take for granted that, that the message uh, of, of Christ is not offered. Uh, and so God is a good God, one that does not want anyone to perish. Not just to go to hell, which is not prepared, man, is not prepared for mankind, but the fallen things, but be cast into the lake of fire, right? So hell itself is going to be judged, and then, then the lake of, hell is turned into the lake of fire, right? The whole, the whole, whole of hell goes into the lake of fire, right? Um, so think about the years you've been on this earth. Think about how long ago Christ came. Think about how long this earth had been in existence, as we said before, and that's the eternity of suffering from God, where there, there's no party down there. Right? There's no party there. It's, it's just torment. Think about the worst pain you've been through, multiplied over and over again, and then that's the torment that you're in all the time. There is no Advil. There ain't no, nothing coming. You were just in torment the entire time. But many are perishing because we're all sinners. Matthew 53 and 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon us the iniquity, upon him the iniquity of us all. In Jeremiah 17, 9, we said it tonight, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How many ever heard a person say to them, oh, you know, Lord knows my heart. Lord knows my heart. Lord knows my heart. And we can come back and say, yeah, your heart is desperately wicked. Your heart is desperately wicked. Where do you get that from? Jeremiah 17, 9. That's what, the, that's what the Lord says about your heart. So he knows your heart. He knows it's definitely wicked. So we got to make a, a choice in this matter, right? Uh, but Christ died, the second in the Trinity, the equal to God, because he's God, took the form of mankind and took our place on the Calvary's cross to pay the full penalty for man's sin. He took our place. And so we can believe, 
We can believe all this. However, it is not good enough to say that this is true. Each person must claim by personal choice, that's our will, and rely exclusively upon Christ's work on the cross to be the full payment of our sin debt. We deserve eternal separation from God because none of us are good at all, and Christ paid that penalty for us. That's the only way we get to the foundation. It's the only way. If you believe that Christ paid that sin and took your place and you have confessed him to be Lord over your life, you have just entered salvation and you're now on the foundation of what was laid. And I don't care if you have a huge experience with it or you're jumping up, running, snot coming out your nose and crying. Christ, if you have prayed that prayer, Christ has come into your life. And now if you are choosing to wait, most people tell you that tomorrow's not promised, but that's a lie. Tomorrow is promised. Because on the day that we expire from this life, we will either be in paradise with our Lord or we are going to be eternally separated. So tomorrow is promised. It's just where you're going to choose on this day who you're going to serve. This is not a scare tactic. It's just a fact. And you have to choose this day who you and where you desire to be. Because we know that tomorrow is promised. No matter where we open up. So, Heavenly Father, right now, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for these that came out this evening, those that have been on social media and just listening in. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit would do its work even right now to begin the drawing from whenever they might hear this, that your word has gone out forward. And we know on social media, everything stays out there. So we, we don't know when somebody might look at this. But we ask that you, the Spirit would just speak to them right now and to cause them to make a decision a decision to choose eternity with you versus eternity without you. And we just give you all the honor and the power and the praise. So protect your people this evening as they go from this pre place but not, never your presence. Protect their homes. Protect the safety of their travel. And give them peace and comfort. Even until you should return. And we give you all the honor, the power, and the praise and glory. In Jesus Christ, and for our sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. <laughs>